February 28, 1997. A shootout at the Bank of America in North Hollywood, California. Bank robbers dressed from head to toe in body armor storm the bank. As police surround the building, the robbers calmly walk out, machine guns blasting. The handguns the police use can't penetrate their body armor, so the criminals casually make their getaway. Though it seems there's nothing police can do to bring them down, the robbers are eventually mortally wounded after the police buy more powerful firearms at a local gun store. But patrol officers did not have any weapon in the field that was able to penetrate that vest. Now they do. Ever since the North Hollywood shootout, they've given patrolmen better handguns so he can defeat the body armor that the suspects are wearing. As the Bank of America shootout and subsequent rearming of the Los Angeles Police Department illustrates, the age-old duel between weapon and shield rages on. Today's weapons, of course, are ballistic. And the shields are bulletproof. In the midst of this covert world of top secret technology and scientific testing lies an amazing array of materials which can stop even the most powerful bullet. The technology is so advanced, it is invisible. Everywhere we look, though we may not see it, there is protection against gunfire. We took our bullet-resistant fiberglass panels and introduced the application inside walls, and you never know which walls are bullet-resistant. All of our vehicles are made to look as a, like a common vehicle, so an attacker would not be able to tell that the vehicle is armored. Sometimes the protection is made obvious so as to intimidate the enemy. Loomis Fargo and Company wants high-profile vehicles. We want the bad guys to know that we mean business. Whatever the choice, the decision to guard against the threat of a firearm is a complicated one. The potential danger must first be identified. It's important to sit down with the customer and find out exactly what they feel they need protection against. We actually call out levels of protection by the type of ammunition we're providing uh, protection against. Since a given material may only stop certain types of bullets, most industry experts refer to them as bullet resistant. For each benefit that you find in a new material, it also has its Achilles heel. And the key in all this is where do you hide the Achilles heel? The biggest challenge, of course, is getting these remarkable materials to succeed in the real world. Really, it's always been a trade-off between protection and mobility, because as you try to increase the protection level to stop bigger and faster bullets, you have to increase weight. When you add weight to a vehicle, you have to increase the horsepower of the system. Well, a soldier gets tired. As you increase the weight, it degrades the performance of the soldier in the field. The race to develop gear that can neutralize deadly weapons started with the beginning of warfare. After mastering metallurgy around 7000 BC, ancient cultures began fashioning both weapons and protection against them. The Greeks sophisticated the techniques. Once metalworking became widespread, bronze armor uh, became very popular. Even when they developed iron for bladed weapons, they still kept bronze for body armor because it was supple. Being soft, it would absorb a blow rather than shatter. The Romans were particularly adept at working with several different forms of armor. Leather works on the principle that it, it doesn't try to deflect a blow, it tries to absorb it mail, which is interlinked rings of, uh, of iron, would work very well against a cutting blow. And it was actually probably the most common form of armor worn by the Romans, more familiar than the interlinked uh, strips of armor, uh, lorica segmentata. After the fall of Rome, armorers continued to experiment with body armor. But the breastplate and chainmail remained virtually unchanged until the late 14th century when full iron plate armor began to make its way onto the battlefield. These suits took months to make and were so expensive only the elite, the knights who rode with the army, could afford them. But they did provide an extraordinary degree of protection against the weapons of their time. It really did start to heat up in the 14th century. With the introduction of plate armor, the weapons of the 13th century became far less effective. The stabbing and hacking sword, the longbow, could not penetrate the plate. 
The protection that plate armor provided would not last long. The gun appeared on the battlefields of Europe around 1360. In its earliest form, it was no more than a crude handheld version of the cannon. But its potential for blasting through defenses was obvious. The handgun upped the ante in this competition between the weapon maker and the armorer because with the chemical power of the bullet, you could get something that hit as hard as the most powerful crossbow. It was a very simple, primitive weapon that could be issued in large numbers. By the late 1400s, improvements in the firing mechanism of the gun made it much more accurate and popular. The bullets soon began penetrating the iron plate armor. It seemed the suits, only an eighth of an inch thick, would soon become obsolete. But resourceful armorers developed a better protection by adding more carbon to the iron, forming a rudimentary steel. The breastplate was now twice as solid. By the middle of the 16th century, the armorer had gotten a little ahead. So it had once more gotten to the point where if you had enough money, you could buy survival on the battlefield. Again, only well-to-do aristocratic knights on horseback were able to pay the price. This was the period when the term bulletproof uh, came into the, into the lexicon. Uh, in the 16th century, uh, to prove was to test. And the armorers would prove their plate armor by taking a pistol and shooting the pistol into the breastplate. And it would leave a little dent. And whenever someone was buying uh, breastplates, they'd look for that little dent that proved that breastplate was bulletproof. Though a cavalryman was better protected with heavier armor, the protection came at a price. It further impeded his mobility and ability to fight. They were slow. And while, while they could manage a quick gallop for a charge, the horse was the one who tired. The heavier the rider, the less the horse could do. And these lancers essentially had their one charge. Then their horses would be spent, and they would be sitting ducks. In the late 1500s, the advantage once again shifted to gunmakers, who had designed a weapon with a more powerful bullet speed, the musket. The gun was almost six feet long, weighed about 20 pounds, and could fire a 75 caliber round more than 100 yards. Because its large barrel was able to hold more gunpowder, by 1650, the musket could blast through even the heaviest armor. It was the anti-tank weapon of the period. Um, it upped the ante once again uh, to the point where there was just no question. There was no plate armor around that could stop a musket. The key to firearms in these early era is you didn't need any skill. Anybody could be taught to load a firearm. You didn't need constant practice like a longbow. As gun designers continued to make improvements in accuracy and firepower, European leaders began conscripting massive armies. During this period, the focus was on firepower. The commanders who had a very scientific view of warfare didn't want to distract from that purpose. So they tried to make the soldier a shooting machine. Armor was considered to be a distraction. Guns were cheap, and so were men. Armor had no place on the battlefield. The bullet would hold the upper hand in the race between weapons and protective gear for hundreds of years. It was only when soldiers found themselves trapped in trenches in World War I that a new form of body armor appeared. The way you kill a man in a trench is with an airburst of artillery. You have a round shower of the trench with fragments. This created considerable casualties among men whose only protection was a wool hat. The helmet was invented by the French in 1915. It was soon adopted by the Americans in 1917. Made of steel, the helmet adequately protected soldiers from shrapnel bursts. Protective vests for the Allied soldiers were tested during the war by Englishman Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. But General Sir Douglas Hay, commander of the British forces, rejected the idea on the grounds that only cowards would want to wear one. Thank you.
Though several tests were conducted over the next few decades, body armor wasn't available to soldiers for the first half of the 20th century. It was just too heavy. Um, survival on the 20th century battlefield is all about moving very fast and being able to, to drop down behind cover and it's extremely tiring. You're going to be a sitting duck if you happen to have this full body protection. That all changed with the introduction of a new synthetic fiber created by DuPont in the 1930s. Nylon. Much stronger than most natural fibers, researchers discovered that by tightly weaving nylon, then building it up in layers, it could resist some ammunition. The new material was quickly dubbed ballistic nylon. Black jackets made of ballistic nylon appeared in the last years of World War II. They were used to keep airmen safe from the shrapnel of anti-aircraft guns. The infantryman, however, remained unprotected until an improved flak jacket became standard issue during the Korean War. It consisted of rigid plates made of aluminum and covered with ballistic nylon. By Vietnam, flak jackets had once again been improved. The military found that by adding more layers of ballistic nylon and removing the metal plates, the jackets afforded better protection. These jackets were essentially the predecessors to the modern-day bulletproof vest but they were still ineffective against a direct hit. In the early 1970s, the U.S. Army began testing several tougher materials in body armor vests. At the same time, civilian Richard Davis, who had been shot by a robber while delivering pizza, began experimenting with a super strong plastic called Kevlar, produced by DuPont. The new material was then being used to strengthen tires, but Davis put the material in a vest and used himself as the test subject. Quite frankly, the officers did not believe that uh, this type of soft material could stop bullets. Uh, at that point, he decided to get in front of a group, large group of police officers in the Detroit area where he did uh, shoot himself. Davis not only wanted to prove he could survive a direct hit, but that he could fire his gun immediately after an attack. Got to fire this into a second chance now on armor. Get a more metal in here. We'll cut this away afterwards to show you. Now we'll assume that those guys over there are the bowling pins, are the ones that are doing the shooting on me. And if the shock is not enough to knock me out or kill me, we'll try to kill the bowling pins and find out whether this thing works or not. If it does, you can save a thousand men in the next ten years. If it doesn't, they're going to die as I will. The daring all-or-nothing experiment was a success. Today, Davis's company, Second Chance, is the largest supplier of body armor in North America. The material for Second Chance vests comes in bulk to the manufacturer, where it is assembled into multiple layers and compressed. Each layer of material has a specific function. The inner layers absorb moisture from the body and help the vest breathe. The outer layer is usually a ballistics nylon that helps slow the bullet down. The middle layer, which is bullet resistant, is usually made of Kevlar, a tightly woven rigid polymer. Its function is to stop a bullet from entering the vest. Because manufacturers strive to design lightweight, comfortable vests, sometimes the material's ability to resist bullets is compromised. In fact, almost 50% of body armor vests fail to stop a round in the testing phase. And so scientists must continually try to develop better materials and designs. Up next, the science of stopping a bullet. The saying, a flash in the pan, originated when gunpowder in the firing mechanism of a musket rifle was ignited and quickly burned without launching the bullet. Bulletproof will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Bulletproof on Modern Marvels. Please go home! To stop a bullet from killing a person takes some pretty amazing science. 
theoretically, you could put a tombstone around uh, someone's uh, neck if they could carry it, and it, would, and it would offer a maximum amount of protection against a number of uh, small arms. A tombstone, however, would be extremely impractical. Enter science and technology, and a tough rating system to make sure that everything works. Kevlar, produced by DuPont, is effective because it stops a bullet by disseminating the energy over a wider area. Much like a baseball mitt absorbing the impact of a baseball. The person wearing the Kevlar becomes the catcher. At Southwest Research Institute, the Material Development Department, Ballistics Division, conducts tests on all types of ballistic materials. The materials are usually brought to the small range facility for testing. This is the universal gun system that we use to fire the uh, small arms projectiles in this lab. Here's where we measure our projectile velocity. These are chronograph screens. They have a series of infrared emitters at the top and a series of infrared detectors here at the bottom. It makes a plane of infrared light. When the projectile passes through, it interferes with some of that light, which is detected by the electronics of this, and it sends a signal into the other room to a time interval counter. And based on the known distance between those two screens and the known time between those two screens, we can calculate the velocity. Just beyond the velocity measurement system, we have the target area. The instrumentation that we're going to be using today is the Emicon 468. It's an ultra-high-speed digital camera system. And this camera system will take a picture every 10 nanoseconds. And if you do the math on that, that's 100 million frames per second. And we only get eight pictures out of it, but we get them very quickly. The data gathered here will be sent to a ballistic scientist who will study and evaluate the information for the client. My role in ballistics research is looking at the ballistic event from a numerical simulation point of view. We do large-scale computations. The first simulation shows a round hitting a hard steel plate, and this is a ball round. It's filled with lead, as you can see. That's the yellow color. And as the round comes down and hits the hard steel plate, you'll see that it begins to deform a lot. That's because the steel plate is strong and it doesn't want to bend. But the bullet's moving very fast, and it continues moving even though the front has stopped. The Institute also studies what happens when a material doesn't stop a bullet. Here we design new armors, and because of that, a lot of our tests, you actually have a perforation of the armor. The bullet goes through because we're really pushing the limit on how light we can go and new designs, ideas like that. Because of that, when we run a test, we compare those things. Like, what happened inside that target plate? Why did it end up failing? Where did the failure start? The Southwest Research Institute is also studying a promising new class of materials, high-tolerant ceramics, which don't shatter but as of now are too heavy for most situations. We also did a test where a hard ceramic element completely defeat an armor-piercing round. Ceramics are very hard, and as long as they can be kept intact, they're able to completely defeat a round without any deformation or failure of the target. And as we look at that kind of information, we're able to build up a complete picture of what happened to this armor, and through that, we're able to design a better armor, one which will stop the round. When the test results are in, the information from labs like these is sent to the government. A rating system has been established to certify that body armor meets certain standards. The program is under the jurisdiction of the National Institute of Justice, or NIJ, governed by the Department of Justice. If it passes, it comes back to us and we issue the certification documents, which goes back to the manufacturer, and we put them in our database so we can attest that they have in fact passed. Testing for military protective gear proceeds quite differently. A company that makes a product for the government must follow strict guidelines. Ceridine, located in Southern California, produces a large portion of the military's hard body armor. The military has to define their um, requirements based on their experience as to what various uh, soldiers or equipment will find in a battlefield condition and that's a very wide range. Ceridine's products based on advanced technical ceramics are at the pinnacle of bulletproof materials. The idea of a ceramic stopping a projectile may be quite alien to the normal way of thinking. We all know that if we drop a plate it breaks. But there are ways of putting a backing on the ceramic to keep those cracks from propagating. Ceridine produces a man-made, lightweight, extremely dense ceramic created of boron carbide. 
Boron carbide is one of the hardest synthetic substances known. It is exceeded in hardness only by a diamond. Because the raw materials are formed and pressed under heat, the process starts in Ceridine's foundry. The process initially starts with a powder. That powder is then uh, formed into a preform in a high pressure press. We take uh, the preform of the ceramic and then place it into an electrically heated induction furnace, usually under an inert atmosphere of nitrogen or argon. The reason for that, of course, is to stop the, uh, the tooling and even the ceramic from oxidizing. The furnace is heated up in excess of 2,000 degrees centigrade. The ceramic is then cleaned. We use uh, polymers to put the backing on. The polymers made out of Kevlar are then bonded with resin and then compressed onto the back face of the ceramic in order to ensure that once the projectile has hit the ceramic and broken, it doesn't go any further. Remarkably, materials more brittle than ceramic have been stopping bullets for decades. Glass, the most fragile of building materials, so breakable even a pebble can shatter it. But when glass is combined with a thin layer of polycarbonate made from plastics, it can effectively stop a bullet. It too becomes essentially transparent armor. You need multiple sheets because you don't want the fractures which start at one side to run all the way to the other. So we have an impact happening and we want to try to localize the damage to the glass so that it actually takes many layers but it doesn't break all the way through. Laminated glass was invented for use in autos in 1909. It consisted of several layers of thick glass with thin clear plastic in between. The layers were bonded together by heat. The glass was used in airplane windshields during World War I, and by the 1920s, in police vans and armored cars. But it wasn't just the cops who used bulletproof glass. Wealthy criminals also paid to have the glass installed in their cars for protection from the police. The armor had one flaw, though. The car was easy to spot because the windshields were flat. The technology to curve bulletproof glass wouldn't make its appearance for another decade. In the 1950s, a process was developed to bend laminated glass for use in car and plane windshields. By the 1970s, it was discovered that thinner layers of glass would flex more before they broke. That decade, DuPont created Spall Shield, a distinctly improved bulletproof glass for buildings such as hospitals, storm shelters, and schools. The glass prevents spalling, the shower of glass that occurs when conventional glass shatters and can stop various levels of penetration, including high-powered gunfire and explosions. In the last few decades, with crime and street violence on the rise, bulletproof polycarbonate glass created completely from plastics has made an appearance. This glass can crush and absorb a bullet upon impact. The polycarbonate is less expensive than real glass with plastic layers, but it is harder to see through. Safeguard Security Company in Texas specializes in polycarbonate products for companies with security concerns, such as banks, fast food restaurants, and gas stations. Our standard window has a bullet-resistant dip tray in the window. It allows people to make transactions from a safe side to a non-safe side. We also make bullet-resistant transaction windows that have transparent hopper devices that allow you to actually see bigger packages transferred from one side of the window to the other. Though it's sometimes difficult to detect bullet-resistant glass, it's virtually impossible to know whether a material similar to Kevlar has been hidden inside walls. Armortex, a division of Safeguard Security, fortifies walls and doors with a lightweight bullet-resistant barrier. Bullet-resistant fiberglass was introduced into the industry because it needed a new option for bullet-resistant protection. At that time, there were only two options, bullet-resistant Kevlar and bullet-resistant steel. Bullet-resistant Kevlar is too expensive, and bullet-resistant steel was very difficult to install, and it was very heavy. Our product is very nice because it's very light, and it's easy to install. Now this is uh, where the bullet actually penetrates here, and the panel is designed so that the resin and the glass will separate at impact, and as it does, it absorbs a projectile here. Safeguard Security houses the complete manufacturing process for these super-tough panels. 
textile looms weave together the starch oil ballistic grade fiber. We start with the fabrics in our own textile operation and we take a special woven roving that we've designed. It's got a special amount of yarns per inch of material that allow us to, in conjunction with pull resistant resins that we use, to make a flat, rigid panel. When finished, the panels are sold separately to reinforce walls and installed into metal doors that are also manufactured on site. What we do there is we take a metal skin, we put the fiberglass in the core of the door, and we put another skin over that, and we weld it closed and make a hollow metal door. Wooden doors are fortified too. They are designed to look like any ordinary wooden door. Would-be criminals wouldn't know the difference. We take our bullet resistant fiberglass panel, and we adhere wood on both sides. Then we take a wood veneer and adhere it to that. Then we take that compound, we put it into a press, to make sure it's perfectly flat and that the laminate is, is securely fastened to the door. Then we take it out of the press and we install it on the frame. While criminals may not know if a wall or door will stop a bullet, the sight of an armored truck is deliberately designed to leave no doubt. Up next, armor takes to the road. Bulletproof glass can withstand a round of gunfire exerting well over 150,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Bulletproof will return on Modern Marvels. In the business of bulletproofing, not letting the enemy know what has been armored gives the defender a distinct advantage. But with armored trucks, the idea is to design them to look as impenetrable as possible. SWAT teams rely on highly fortified, highly intimidating vans called personnel carriers. In the old days, we might have to run up with a police car and position that in between us so we could rescue the victim. The guys that were driving that car or the policemen who were doing that rescue were in great danger. Now at least we have the capability of coming up with a ballistic vehicle that will stop a lot of the rounds that the suspects are shooting. Inside, it's got very small windshields because um, they want the majority of the vehicle to be steel. It actually has a shield that pops up and protects somebody who can be up inside that, that hole with a gun, providing cover, fire, or whatever we might need him to do. Um, it's a very heavy vehicle. It weighs about 10,000 pounds. The back of the vehicle has two bench seats on either side, which can accommodate approximately six uniformed SWAT officers in the back. Humans are not the only cargo transported by these moving strongholds. Money is by far the largest haul. Loomis, one of America's biggest money haulers, moves massive amounts of currency for the U.S. government. We basically pick up the money at the Federal Reserve, take it to correspondent banks, and in turn, correspondence banks will then send it to commercial banks. Commercial banks will then send it to retail outlets. The company also transports money to and from automated tellers around the country. The imposing trucks, which weigh over 60,000 pounds, are armored throughout with several layers of metal and can withstand multiple high-powered gunfire. Remarkably, these armored vehicles are handmade. At the Supreme Manufacturing Facility near Fort Worth, Texas, it takes a team of craftsmen about 30 days to complete a cab from the ground up. To build an armored truck, we order in the material, we bring it together, cut it to size, and then we lay it out on what we call a jig. And we fully weld the armored truck inside and out. Surprisingly, the walls used to create the frame are made of aluminum. Heavily fortified aluminum absorbs the blow of a bullet by deforming, but not splitting. Once the frame is built, it is put onto the chassis and painted. It's now ready to protect our most valued assets. The progenitor of the armored truck, of course, is the tank, which made its first appearance during World War I. With two sides facing off against each other from trenches, generals needed to protect soldiers crossing enemy lines. The tank was the answer. By virtue of its thick steel plates, the tank was bulletproof and it quickly transformed the landscape of modern warfare. Bulletproof transportation for commercial purposes immediately caught on after the war. In the post-war boom years, businesses were rapidly expanding, and transporting large sums of cash became problematic. Dunbar Armored, among others, helped fill the void. Back in the 20s, people were not paid by check. 
you were paid in cash from the factory. So the paymaster that worked at a company would have to physically go by get the payroll for that week and drive back to the factory. And that's where the holdups would take place. The manufacturers found that it was a lot easier just having the armored car pick up the money and deliver to the factories. But criminals soon had their cars specially reinforced with steel panels. The police were forced to follow suit by proofing their own personnel carriers to protect themselves from criminals. Hitler had a bulletproof car designed for him, too, though no one took aim at the car during World War II. When the American 101st Airborne Division finally made their way to Hitler's bunker, they riddled the car with bullets to vent their feelings about its former passenger. After World War II, America experienced another economic boom. All of a sudden, there were banks that had branches out in the suburbs because the people were all moving out into the suburbs. That's when the armored car companies started servicing the branches. When automated tellers sprang up in the early 1980s, the armored truck business once again enjoyed an upsurge in demand. Today, Dunbar is one of the top three armored truck companies in the U.S., hauling vast amounts of money for the government and the private sector. As with body armor, mobility versus protection is a key issue for armored trucks. How heavy can you make a truck and its payload and still find an engine to run it? You want to keep the, the weight down on the vehicle in order to be able to put more weight and coinage and so forth that you are carrying. An armored truck built today, the body of it will last for 15 years. The chassis won't last that long. So you're removing the body maybe three times to three different chassis. But the need for armored vehicles extends far beyond commercial and law enforcement use. Up next, arming a passenger vehicle against an attack. In 1903, a story called The Land Ironclads by H.G. Wells featured a self-propelled armored military vehicle. 13 years before the first tank appeared on the battlefield, Bulletproof will return on Modern Marvels. The news is full of frightening scenarios conjured by one-word headlines. Ambushes, attacks, kidnappings, hostages, ransoms. Since the 1970s, the rise in terrorism has forced executives, celebrities, and dignitaries to make their cars safe for travel. This has created a lucrative niche for those in the business of providing armor-proofing materials. Texas Armoring in San Antonio, Texas, fortifies passenger vehicles for a range of situations and threat levels around the world. In the United States, the market is growing fast. Most of the clients in the United States have been political figures or religious leaders. As always, balancing protection against mobility is the critical challenge. How to armor a car against heavy gunfire and still have it drive with the ease and maneuverability of a regular car? You are adding 1,500 or 2,000 pounds to a vehicle. The weight added to the vehicle would prevent problems with the suspension, the braking system, but a lot of those we, we correct when we armor a vehicle. Armorers today are always searching for lightweight materials to lessen the load. SpectraShield, a new super light ballistics material, is used in the doors of the vehicles. Similar to Kevlar, SpectraShield has multiple layers and is pressed with a resin to form a hard bullet resistant panel. To armor the door, we would take off the interior door panel and then put SpectraShield into the door. And then when there's not a space where the SpectraShield can fit because of the thickness of the SpectraShield, we would replace it with ballistic steel. Then we would replace the uh, door panel and all the wiring basically stays the same. Then the window would be placed in and it would be fixed. The process is repeated throughout the car with various materials. When we armor a vehicle, the, the entire passenger compartment, which is the whole cabin area of the vehicle, will be protected, as well as the gas tank, the battery, the radiator, which would allow a vehicle more time to get out of the situation. The floor and ceiling of the cab is lined with thick ballistic nylon. The high hardened steel is the material we use in the firewall 
and in the pillars and posts, everywhere that needs to be protected against direct hits of high power rifle. When finished, these cars look as if they're straight off the showroom floor, but they're as safe a fortress as the armored truck. An attacker would not be able to tell that the vehicle is armored. Ogera Hess and Eisenhart, the world's largest passenger vehicle armoring company, designed the first presidential bulletproof car at the behest of the Secret Service for President Harry S. Truman in 1948. They have fortified each presidential limousine since then. Like Texas Armoring, their clients fear terrorist threats as well. Ogera Hess and Eisenhart also beefs up many luxury cars for the private sector. And they armor vehicles for the military. We are the sole source provider of the up-armored Humvee for the U.S. Army and Air Force. And this is a wheeled armored vehicle that's capable of defeating assault rifle threats and landmine attacks. As with armored trucks, aluminum is used to fortify O'Gara Hess and Eisenhart's passenger vehicles. The material speaks for itself. Every client who has been attacked by gunfire while driving O'Gara Hess and Eisenhart's vehicles has survived. Some clients in the armored car market require the ability to shoot back at an attacker. Ibis Tech in Pennsylvania has created a remarkable bulletproof vehicle with a remote-controlled large-caliber gun that can do just that. The company produces about 100 trucks a year with an asking price of up to $500,000. Ibis Tech has developed the Cobra Viper in response to known threats uh, in particularly the Middle East. Our objective was to provide security and protection, which does not look offensive in nature. The gun is controlled from the passenger side of the vehicle. It is a fully stabilized. It has gyroscopes that determine uh, the movement of the vehicle, the movement of the weapon as it's being fired, so that it stabilizes the system, uh, so that you get very accurate fire, even on the move. The high-caliber machine gun can strike a target. Hyper commencing fire in three, two, one. Over 1,000 yards away. Though one car company offered to install a machine gun in a bulletproof car they were fortifying for Pope John Paul II, the Vatican respectfully declined. It was decided it wouldn't look good to see the Pope blasting himself out of harm's way. The Pope has a fleet of over 20 different vehicles. They can be as unpretentious as an SUV, or as conspicuous as the car everyone associates him with, the Pope Mobile. The Pope has been riding in these bulletproof vehicles since 1981. Religious figures and other dignitaries, of course, also need to be protected outside their vehicles. Up next, how to protect a politician from an assassin's bullet. The armoring of a passenger car can cost up to $100,000, not including the cost of the original vehicle. Bulletproof will return on Modern Marvels. Hello. Hello. Ready? In the race to keep ahead of ever-improving weapons, today's market is ripe with emerging bullet-resistant technologies. And the future promises some amazing new materials and applications. Already, political candidates and others who fear assassination when publicly speaking can use the Instantaneous Personnel Protection Shield, designed by Ibis Tech. The Instantaneous Personnel Protection System, or as we call it, IPS, is a high technology integration which will detect an incoming bullet and actually deploy a protective blanket before the bullet can reach the target. The system is designed to be able to uh, detect a bullet approaching the target in approximately 5 to 10 milliseconds and then deploy in 40 to 50 milliseconds. Another incredible application of burgeoning safety technology is being used by NASA. 
the government is installing Kevlar-based materials around the outside of the space station to protect it from floating space debris, making even structures in outer space bulletproof. There are two areas where you're concerned. One is from micrometeoroid or meteoroid impacts on the spacecraft. The other one is actually from orbital debris, pieces of stuff we've left up there on previous missions. Then there's a lot of it up there now. Closer to home, bullet-resistant clothing is another area in which ballistics technology is making great strides. Formerly reserved for James Bond-type spies and government officials, the demand for personal protection has now made it to the general public. At Bulletproof Me, windbreakers and coats are bestsellers. Special orders? Dinner jackets and raincoats. In the future, some bullet-resistant materials could be harvested from nature. Another area uh, which is uh, being evaluated and looked at now is in the biomaterials arena and this is where we're just beginning to understand what mother nature has produced and how strong that is a very uh, good case which has been in study now for years by the army is the silk from the orb spider spider silk is five times stronger than steel weaving the silk together tightly and layering it as is done with synthetics such as kevlar would create a super strong vest the material does, however, have a drawback. It stretches too much. A bullet would at present penetrate too deeply into a spider silk vest. Harvesting spiders on a large enough scale to collect silk for bulletproof vests would also be difficult and expensive. The ability to create spider silk body armor is still in the distant future. But scientists are working on spin-offs inspired by nature. The difficulty with it, of course, is that Mother Nature knows how to produce it, and we don't. But this is where genetic, uh, genetic engineering, uh, materials engineering, uh, and all the other sciences now start coming into play. In other areas, uh, we can look at, for instance, the, the shell of an abalone, which is an amazingly very strong, very tough, very resilient material, something we would like to mimic in, in, in an armor material. With a shell only one-eighth of an inch thick, the abalone is able to protect itself from almost 300 pounds of pressure per square inch. Advances in man-made materials are equally remarkable. In the future, bulletproof smart materials will work by remembering what their original shape was and bouncing back into it. Theoretically, they would be designed with their molecular structure purposely misarranged. If a bullet struck the material, the heat from the shot would cause the molecules to correctly align. This action would instantaneously strengthen the material, causing it to stop the bullet. Smart materials are still very much off in the future, mainly because when a bullet impacts a piece of armor that occurs in such a very short time frame, it's not clear yet as though those materials will actually be able to respond in thousandths of a second. With such mind-boggling bulletproof possibilities on the horizon, it's not inconceivable that bulletproof technology will one day lead to a world in which everyone and everything will be routinely bulletproofed. All the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the buildings we use. But if history is any guide, the day the world really figures out a way to bulletproof itself will be the same day some new, as yet unimaginable weapon of death will emerge. And the whole long cycle of devising ways to protect ourselves will begin all over again.